change on the call stack to walk. Um, even without expressions, we can do a couple minor tricks. Uh, we can bypass one exception handle in favor of another if we know how far apart they are. Uh, that was sort of the first modification I did when I was still plugging in things in the hex editor, uh, which is not nearly as fun as having a nice ASCII format you can manipulate. The hex editor gets sort of tiring after a few hours. Um, so, uh, an example of how we do that, if an FTE normally has an instruction, uh, so def CFA register R6 just defines that the CFA is taken from register 6, uh, which is the base pointer in x 64 um, And then we define the rule for register 16 as being stored at an offset of one word from the CFA. Uh, R16 is the return address. So this is how we determine which function is called this function, which is call frame is one higher on the stack. Uh, so if we modify this, and I'm just assuming five words in the call frame here, uh, obviously you adjust this as appropriate for your target. Um, you just define the uh, return address to come from a different place on the stack, and then you can just skip a frame. Um, so that, that's just a little party trick. It's not very useful. With dwarf expressions, we can do a lot more. Uh, we can redirect exceptions to a different exception handler, um, and as you'll see, we can even find functions and resolve symbols, and we can calculate the locations. Uh, so we, with the dwarf expressions giving us control flow instructions and memory dereferencing, we can essentially do any computation that we could be doing in C or whatever. And load the result back into registers as the virtual machine carefully restores them after the, after the stack has been unlocked. Uh, so if we've got some function foo that handles the throne exception, but we want some different function bar to handle it. Uh, so let's just suppose that bar lives at uh, good food and we change the FTE to foo. We have it defines the return address as, again, coming at an offset of one word from the CFA. Um, so we put in a dwarf ins uh, expression here, and we find R16 return address to come from the result of the expression. And all we do in the expression is just load a constant for where we want it to be, and then we're all set. Again, just a little trick. Um, but you probably want to do a lot more. You say these tricks are kind of boring. Uh, so we can set registers and redirect unwinding. But how do we get out of the unwinder? We found a function, we actually want to return there. Um, and control of the H frame isn't enough for that. That only lets us land in <coughs> catch blocks that have already been defined in the program. And this isn't within the realm of the dwarf standard. The dwarf standard was created for debugging. It was just sort of adopted by GCC and Linux people for this use. Um, and the x 64 ABI doesn't cover this, but extended space doesn't cover this. This is GCC specific here, how we can stop the unwinding. Um, it was actually interesting that <coughs> the dwarf standard is so flexible in defining uh, language specific data and something called a personality routine, which is a language specific function to interpret that data. Um, so it's actually possible for exception handling sections in different languages to coexist with different personality routines that interpret the language specific data differently. And what the language specific data is used for is to determine exactly that, how to stop the unwinding, where a catch handler is to be found. But if we can control that data, we can just pretend that there's a catch block anywhere we like. It doesn't have to actually be a catch block there. Um, so this section <coughs> that we're interested in is GCC accept table. Uh, so let's see what we can do with GCC accept table. It has the language specific data, it's interpreted by the personality routine, control of it, let us stop the exception handling, now, there's no documentation for this. Uh, every now and then on the GCC mailing list, someone will say, hey, how do I know what goes on in GCC accept table? And Ian Lance Taylor or someone will give a two <coughs> sentence description of kind of sort of what it does and just say, well, there isn't really any documentation. Um, so actually, the only, there, there is a survey mentioned earlier. Uh, there's one outdated Hewlett Packard document um, that you can't even find on Hewlett Packard's website anymore uh, that sort of describes this format. It's outdated, it's incomplete. Uh, the most useful documentation is actually the verbose assembly generated by GCC. When you tell generate verbose assembly, you can take a look at what's generated. Um, so I, I don't know if you can read that in this light, um, but the comments in there are how I actually figured out what the hell was going on here. So think of this as the ultimate lazy way 
of generating documentation, right? You don't put your documentation in the code and then have some sort of a Java doc type of utility run over it. No, your documentation, you know, your entire development documentation, you might say, is generated by your assembler when you uh, bother to do GCC uh, dash capital S and, well, of course, you get your assembly code and then you get a chunk of stuff that is labeled something, exception table, blah, blah. And uh, that's just about it. And it's already in bytecode. So your GCC, uh, while showing you normal assembly, uh, does not show you any uh, rhyme or reason for you know, this bunch of text bytes uh, that uh, get generated into that section. Uh, so let me spare you the pain of trying to piece together exactly how this format works with no documentation at all. Um, so the GC accept table consists of an array of LSDA, language specific data areas. Um, and an FTE which has some catch handlers will have a pointer to an LSDA area. Um, and GCC will read in that pointer and interpret it as one of these LSDA structures. Uh, so we have a header, a call site table, an action table, and a type table. So the call site table specifies for a function all of the different regions in that function. Um, and each call site record may point to an element in the action table. If it doesn't point to anything in the action table, it means there's no, call, there's no catch handler there. Um, the action table is a linked list of entries in the type table. And the type table essentially says, um, there's, well, that's our entries in the type table and where to return control to. Um, so the type table, we don't care about the format of that very much. That's C++ specific identifiers for types uh, that lets the personality routine filter your exception handlers on what type of exception was thrown. Um, so if you imagine uh, the assembly uh, chunk generated for your text, uh, for your actual uh, code, uh, as uh, in the uh, output of GCC uh, dash S. Uh, here is your code. Here is your exception handling data. And your code has a lot of labels that you can't quite uh, parse. Uh, those labels stand. Uh, those labels stand in places where registers are likely saved. Then uh, if those labels get referred to in the body of the exception handling data. So, you know, as you uh, uh, assemble and link, as you create the object files, those offsets will be computed, uh, you know, together with all the other offsets for local variables and so on. But uh, essentially your uh, exception handling information is stitched together with the offsets into your code at that point. And the compiler, of course, in its wisdom, uh, detects uh, the places that affect the unwinding of the step in the code and marks those instructions. Uh, so if I went over any of that too quickly to follow, the important upshot is that the GC accept table lets us determine where GCC thinks that the catch blocks live. So I don't want to deal with that binary format. It's not even properly documented. Uh, so I added support for LSDAs to Forescript. Um, so if we have um, so the stupid little C++ program here, uh, we see this is what GC generates for it. Um, we've got, for each call site, we've got a position telling where it begins in the beginning of the function, um, how long the call site is, and then the landing pad is where the execution is transferred to, and that's relative to the beginning of the function. Um, so if we decide there is a catch handler in this call site, this is where we want to stop the unwinding, that determines where we jump to. So obviously, that's a work in our control if we want to change that. Um, and we've got the link list of action table, type table, etc. Um, they're not particularly interesting. Pretty simple. Uh, that should give you a clue why this format was chosen for exception handling in the first place. Why the debugging format uh, made such a strange uh, reappearance. Now, if you think of the debugging uh, table, uh, a debugging table in dwarf generated uh, by GCC is per instruction. So in the uh, debugging table, uh, you have uh, a line per instruction 
And these lines contain quite a lot of information, such as which code, source code line they refer to, whether this instruction is at the, at the boundary of a basic block or not, and many other things. Uh, hence, uh, you know, uh, this uh, power at describing code sites. So with exception handling, uh, became instruction granular, that was a natural choice. That must have been a natural choice. So well, let's take a look at what actually happens when we throw an exception. Uh, so user code throws an exception. It calls uh, CXA allocate exception is extended C++. It calls CXA call <coughs> exception is extended C++. Um, and what that does is call a function called online raise exception. And that function is guaranteed to exist by uh, x86.64 ABI. Uh, and most of this is exactly the same in x86. I've just been working with 64 yeah. for the most part. Um, so online rate exception, online is one frame, um, runs through the dwarf information for doing that. There's a personality routine for the <coughs> function for the FDE that it's unwinding currently. It calls that personality routine, um, which reads the language specific data we've just been talking about in UCC accept data. Um, so if there's, no hand, except if there's no handler found, it just loops and unwinds another frame. And it keeps doing that until it finds a handler. Uh, once it does find a handler, it returns into it um, in the handlers that you see generated by GCC. There's some bookkeeping. There's a body of the handler. Um, <coughs> and then the execution just continues. Um, so nothing particularly interesting there, just bookkeeping details. And most of this is standardized by ABIs. Um, the personality routine, as I discussed, is not. Um, so let's take a look at what we can do with this. So we can backdoor our program that performs perfectly normally until the exception is thrown, as I showed at the beginning. Uh, and we can we control the accept table. We can return from an exception to anywhere in the program. We can just pretend that there's a catch block where there isn't one. Um, so let's go back to the demo. <coughs> it's just a stupid little code. Doesn't do anything interesting. We just switch, look at the input, and if it's something we don't recognize, we throw an exception. So what we used is a return with C attack, essentially. Um, created a dynamic linker built in Dwarf to find the exact function, since there was no follow exact or anything anywhere in that program. Um, and we used Dwarf to set up the stack. Except, of course, uh, staff, uh, program staff, was not involved at all. So this uh, returning to libc was accomplished <laughs> from the um, exception handling path through the exception handling information. And by the way, we did not know the address of exec. So we just used a dynamic linker, a fully function dynamic functioning dynamic linker, ladies and gentlemen, to resolve that symbol. And that's the least this technique can do. So, you know, Weaponizing it may be an issue, but once you weaponize it, uh, it's nice to bring your own dynamic linker. ASLR might not like that. Um, so we, there's, well, I really can't show the full dwarf code here for the dynamic linker because it's reasonably long. I'm happy to show it to anyone later who's interested. Uh, but it's less than 200 bytes. Uh, you have less than 220 words of the computation stack. Uh, dwarf is pretty compact. It was a very conscious design decision.